Okay, I think we'll get started. If everyone's had a chance to download the Menti app or the QR code, then we'll get started with the rounds. Rod and I are happy to present our wellness grand rounds. Uh, we'll be co-presenting and we'll have several guest speakers as well as we get towards the end. Um, and let's have the next slide. So, so you this is to, uh, sorry, I was just gonna say, you don't have to download anything. You can just go to any web browser or on your phone and go to menti.com and put in that QR, uh, put in that code and it should be, it should follow along with the presentation. And this is the first one. So if you've got menti up, you'll see that it's asking you to enter a word or words that, that represent how you and your immediate circle are doing during this pandemic. So we'll just give this a second for people to get used to the technology and uh, to answer and, and, and whatnot so that, that uh, we're all set up for the rest of the presentation. Uh, the Menti does await the number of times it, it, it senses the same word and tends to enlarge the font of that word. Uh, so tired is, uh, is probably represented in a lot of the responses so far. All right, let's go. Such an emerge doc, Wanda. We gotta, we gotta relax. Yeah, we gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and and in, in true emerge spirit, uh, I don't know if people know, but I have a I have a, a renal stone. So we 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 introduced the element of danger into grand rounds that I could suddenly incapacitate <laughs> it, and Wanda would have to <laughs> run, suddenly run take it. over the whole thing. Yeah, that's right. Not, that did happen during our practice last week. Yeah, what's what's entertainment without danger, right? So exactly. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like about um, half of the people, 23 out of 51, have had a chance to put stuff in. Um, so if you're just joining now or, or you're able to, uh, please go ahead and, and go on to menti.com and, and put in that code. Um, uh, and maybe I can put that code in the chat just in case people join later. Or can someone, uh, uh, can someone do that for, for us? Okay, great. Okay, the objectives for today is to recognize and thank our teams during this past year, especially along our COVID journey. Then we're going to begin to discuss the EDI journey that society has taken over the past few years. Well, that'll be followed by a small primer on intrinsic bias and how you can begin to combat that. And then we'll describe some of the recent EDI initiatives that have been happening locally at the hospital, at the university, and at the national level at CAPE. So as you know, Rod and I are both provider value officers responsible for mentoring wellness uh, and orientations and transitions. But other than that, we have no other disclosures. So we're just going to turn the floor over to uh, to Dr. McDonald um, uh, to, to to talk a little bit about this uh, this roller coaster that we were did not consent to be on uh, over the past uh, eighteen <laughs> <laughs> ago or marathon that someone forced me to run. Um, and I'll stop sharing, uh, Christy, for you. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Wanda and Rod, for inviting me today and for organizing this special Grand Rounds. Uh, it certainly has been a remarkable year, a remarkable 16 months. And over the next couple of minutes, I'll take you through our journey. As Rod joked, we didn't consent to this journey, but we sure rose to the occasion. So hopefully I'll show you some good memories over the past year in looking at the first slide that Wanda and Rod Wanda and Rod 
provided tired, exhausted. I think we're all feeling that, but hopefully as we head into the summer, there is hope as well. Now I have to figure out how to, there we go. So our journey started in January of 2020. Many of these scenes you will have seen on TV, uh, have, you know, looking at New York City on the bottom right of the screen, no people around. That started way back in January of 2020. And there was this small virus in Wuhan, China, and it had stayed in Wuhan, China, and we had no idea what the world would face. But there was a glimmer that something was coming. So in February of 2020, the first coronavirus case is recognized in the UK and in London, Ontario. Many of us will remember uh, the first patient who presented to London, Ontario with a direct link to Wuhan, China. And I think probably those who saw her are on the phone today. March 11th was a very memorable day for many of us. Um, that was the day that the WHO declared a worldwide pandemic. This was sort of as we were heading into March break, some people were away in on a sabbatical and thinking, now what? What do we do? Do we go away? How is this going to impact us? And I think this is probably when we first began to be fearful of what was to come. Also in March, 2020, thankfully none of us were stuck on a cruise ship, but you will remember all of these scenes about uh, cruise passengers wondering when they were able to get off and not knowing how to prevent spread. Of the disease. It's when we first became very, very comfortable with PPE, and you'll remember the PPE and our lack of it, you know, in preparation for a pandemic and just our inability in Canada to have PPE and not knowing what was ahead and the, the emotions around that. This was, I remember, a very emotionally charged time for all of us. We didn't know how to keep each other safe, we didn't know how to keep ourselves safe, and we didn't know how to keep our families safe. Thankfully, we're in a, in a much better place coming out of wave three. Each wave has had a theme. In wave one, really it was about PPE and supply chain, the rapid pace of information flow. You'll remember that we would say something in the morning and then by the afternoon it will have changed. And then in the evening it would have changed again. And again, it, it showed our resilience early on and our ability to pivot and be nimble as information was coming fast and furious. And I think really wave one was fear of the unknown. We didn't know what was ahead. We didn't know how to conquer this disease. We didn't know if a vaccine would work. We didn't know if a vaccine would come. And here we are 16 months later uh, vaccinated and our population being vaccinated and those over 12 years old being vaccinated. We've all become very, very familiar with a number of experts in the field. Uh, Teresa Tam, Bonnie Henry, um, David Williams, Isaac Bogosh, uh, who many of us have enjoyed. I was, I, I'm a little bit partial to Isaac. He and I were classmates and buddies through medical school. So it's, it's been fun to watch him. Uh, and as well as our political leaders, you know, Justin Trudeau and um, the many other leaders across the country who truly are doing their best, um, you know, in a, a very difficult position, but wanting the best for our population at their core. Some of the highlights of wave one are on this slide. Uh, certainly the stones, I remember the first couple of stones that were placed outside of the University Hospital, and you can see the rock gardens now. Um, the appreciation from our community, feeding our frontline workers, having uh, our other frontline workers, um, you know, garbage trucks and EMS doing parades around the city to thank us. And leading out of wave one into wave two, there was a bit of a breathing room. And thank you, Wanda, for the excellent rounds in our mid-pandemic marathon. Uh, a highly memorable rounds to have both Haley Wickenheiser and Marie Claire Burke come to us and Wanda mediating that. So that, that was one of the thrills, one of the highs. And the next couple of slides are just a small number of the accomplishments that we had as a group. So in the midst of this, billing seminars, POCA screencasts, COVID studies and funds, virtual simulation, simulation at CSTAR, virtual learning for all of our levels of learners. And our patient care was at its prime and continues at its prime. We've always provided excellent patient care through all of this. We've navigated double cohorts. We've given, well, we haven't given one, just given Cape National ground rounds as, as has Justin, Wanda and Rod, peer-to-peer -peer training and Laura Foxcroft doing that. Staffing model change, having family doctors come and join us within, at in wave one, 
We change the flow of our patients at our sites. We become experts in PPE, in a number of direct admission processes for our COVID patients. We've done hoarding. Uh, all education and meetings through a virtual platform, COVID assessment centers, BiPAP helmets, experts in distancing, power plan developments. We did eye room refreshes. Um, and that's just a, a few of the accomplishments. I think everyone probably here is memory is uh, remembering a number of other accomplishments that I haven't captured here. It, we really have done a good job. The theme in wave two was I think all things IPAC. So distancing, cohorting, PPE. We went through a UH outbreak on four inpatients and throughout the hospital. We had our own UHAD outbreak that we conquered and conquered quickly. And of course, cohorting and uh, uh, both a high and a low uh, with wave two. We have been somewhere on the phases of disaster for the last 16 months. And I really hope we are at the reconstruction and new beginning. Uh, you know, we are coming into better times ahead. More accomplishments, being nimble, gratitude to the community, and many new roles for many of us on the phone. Many have become gourmet cooks. They've become teachers at homeschooling, whether they wanted to or not. We've become Zoom experts. I think too, and in the first slide that Wanda and Rod showed, that we have really come to enjoy the simpler things in life. Wave three has been high volume and high acuity, high community spread and positivity. And now we are coming out of wave three. We've done transfers from GTA. We're now doing transfers from Manitoba. We've hugely expanded our capacity within our organization. And I don't think any of us knew that we could do this, but out of necessity, we have. You've seen this slide a number of times, and I think it will be one that I refer to many times uh, throughout my future uh, in, in my career as an emergency physician. Um, uh, this has helped me throughout this and trying to maintain and stay at the healthy end of the continuum. I think our biggest accomplishment as a team has been very little morbidity in our ED staff to date and zero mortality. And I think to come out 18 months later with this is a huge feat. And we, again, haven't reduced any of our ED services. So please take vacation this summer. Please reflect, refresh, please rejuvenate, please relax. And thank you for your kindness, your perseverance and your courage. It has been quite a journey and we've done exceedingly well. So thank you for all that you've done. I will stop sharing my screen, Rod and Wanda. Thanks very much for allowing me a few minutes and uh, looking forward to the rest of rounds. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's, it's been so, so many ups and downs that it's a little bit of a memory lane to, to think of what we've all been through over the past, you know, year and a half. So uh, thank you so much for that. And what a great team all of you are. Um, um, we're tired of in this together, but we're, this has been uh, forced, <laughs> forced teamwork. Uh, and uh, I am very proud of, of, of all of us. Um, you know, pivoting a little bit in terms of our second objective. Um, I think it's important uh, that when we talk about all of us, uh, that we talk a little bit about the societal um, other uh, waves uh, and, and journeys that we're going through. I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, you know, I think back at my early career to now or even 10 years to now, and it's a very, very different landscape than, than we uh, have uh, faced together and uh, in my mind, long overdue. Um, but just to, to take us a little bit about, you know, what uh, reflecting over the past, you know, five years or so, the Me Too um, phrase was coined by Toronto Burke back in 2006 and didn't get a lot of um, traction until around 2017 when um, uh, Harvey Weinstein uh, emerged uh, in terms of his, of his uh, uh, rampant influence across Hollywood. Um, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but back in 2015, uh, we had an introductory talk from Dr. Derek Haas and I remember that was the first time I'd heard the term mano, uh, where a panel of experts uh, that have been convened were all men. Uh, I remember hearing that for the first time and thinking, oh, geez. And now um, just think about how far we've come. That's a rare, rare event uh, and certainly gets called out on social media very quickly uh, when it, whenever it occurs. Um, 2017 also saw um, uh, Dr. Lawrence Nazar from Michigan, who was, uh, was uh, found to have been serially abusing the US uh, gymnastics team. Um, Lots of uh, um, uh, uh, increase in the um, 
in the movement in 2017, 2018, many names that we remember through like Bill Cosby, Tom Brokaw, R. Kelly, Jeff Epstein, um, really a, a tremendous amount of uh, publication and, and uh, uh, um, movement brought through this. Uh, and uh, I can speak for uh, in terms of nationally, uh, there's a woman in medicine uh, group uh, at CAPE that is very active uh, and as we'll talk later on in rounds, very much uh, in, um, in hopes of, of, of moving this continuity forward. Um, this, uh, an, another movement that we've been kind of uh, witness to uh, in, in history uh, in, over the past few years has been the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Uh, this was coined in 2013 uh, with the death of Trayvon Martin. Uh, and really uh, uh, has reemerged uh, after uh, other examples have occurred mostly in the States, um, but not unique to the States uh, over the, the next few years. Um, I just wanna just mention the theme of, of, of when we talk about equity and cross-sectionality, that, uh, that a lot of, of isms that we're gonna talk about, they traverse a lot of different categories, whether it's gender or race or, or, um, or, or sexual orientation, um, in 2015, 21 transgender people were killed uh, in the United States, of which 13 were black. Um, so the intersectionality is, is a very important concept. And even though we're only highlighting these two movements, there's many, many other important uh, movements that are, that are ongoing. Um, in May 1st, 2018, at that time, 30 million times uh, mark, sorry for the noise in the background, 30 million mark uh, in terms of the use of that hashtag and Twitter. And now obviously we're, we're into multiples and multiple millions. It, this really gained a lot of traction into the common um, uh, psyche of society uh, with the death of uh, George Floyd in May 2020. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the public nature of it and the, uh, the outcry has certainly uh, moved the, the movement very much forward. Uh, and societies and, and universities have come out and really started to, to, uh, to gather their energy to, to begin addressing a lot of issues that have been incredibly long-standing, and start to 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 have an open and honest discussion. Uh, this is in June 2020 from our national organization from Cape. Uh, again, uh, uh, reflecting on on the the events of not only Dar uh, of sorry of George Floyd, but uh, Breonna Taylor as well. Um, and just highlighting one of the sentences there that basically we recognize that unconscious bias and systemic racism exists in our country and in our hospitals as well, and they contribute to inequitable care within our healthcare system. Uh, and that's just such an important thing. I know we're all passionate about giving excellent patient care, uh, but these isms that exist and that are systemic directly affect the, the patients that we're trying to, uh, to uh, help. This is a, a statement from Schulich, uh, looking at, uh, again, responding to, to acts of racism and, and uh, the university itself uh, uh, certainly has uh, um, uh, been active uh, in terms of uh, beginning to address um, um, racism and in terms of system changes. I know Dr. Bertha Garcia was one of the two special advisors that were uh, um, appointed uh, to help advise um, um, uh, Schulich uh, and so, sorry, the University of Western Ontario in regards to, to race. So that's just a primer of that. So uh, we'll, we'll do our next Mendy poll. When I think of the words equity, diversion, inclusion, these words come to mind. And I'll, I'll let you guys uh, begin to fill it up. Sorry, I was uh, so it was that uh, 
just reading through some of the answers or whatnot, and you can see there's a, some commonality of them, a lot of excellent answers, some hesitation, um, which I think is, is understandable as well, um, but a very honest and an open uh, uh, responses, and which is very much appreciated. I'm just gonna, looks like we're, we're about the same mark as we were last time. Just wanna make sure people who have not had a chance to use Menti have, have been able to, uh, to do so. Okay, great. So we're just gonna do a small primer. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the COVID journey and now a little bit about the EDI journey. We're just gonna do a very small primer on, on, on intrinsic bias and some of the strategies to combat it. Combat it. Um, and then afterwards, we're just gonna highlight some of the really important initiatives that are, are happening um, you know, throughout, uh, throughout all organizations. So part of the title that was sent out to you uh, on Elaine's um, email for this rounds was, uh, what do COVID, EDI, and the ED have in, in common? And I received several comments of, what does EDI mean? Well, you're not alone. A couple of weeks ago, I didn't know what it meant either as an acronym. Of course, we all know what equity, diversity, and inclusion mean, but the acronym EDI might be new to us. It certainly won't be the first time you hear it. So I found this definition of each of the terms in the research site of, of, the, of U of T, and I thought it, was, it reflected what I thought was one of the best descriptions of each of the terms. So equity is the fair and respectful treatment of all people. Equity is the process, equality will be the results. Diversity is the geographic mix of the community with a focus on the representation of equity deserving groups. Whereas inclusion is the creation of an environment where everyone feels welcome, is treated with respect, and is able to fully participate. So inclusion will be when diversity isn't even in, in something you have to think about anymore. It's when people just respect people for people, no matter who they are and where they come from. Inclusion is the goal. So let's meet Dr. Sophie El Rashad, a potential new hire as an emergency physician. How long does it take you to develop a first impression of a new person? Answer your poll. Okay, there's our 22 people using Menti. Uh oh, a few more are going to chime in this time. Well, guess what? It's 0.1 second. So our minds determine almost immediately what we think of another person. Just want to define a couple of phrases that are terms that we'll be using here. So bias is a personal preference of likes or dislikes, whereas a stereotype is an attribution of certain characteristics to a group of people. Whereas prejudice then is a positive or negative attitude that is applied to an individual of a group. We'll pull those all together in a minute. Many of you may have seen the discriminant uh, Diversity wheel, sorry. We usually think of the internal pie, the blue pie pieces as being the ones we talk about, like race and gender and sexual orientation, ethnicity, uh, physical abilities and age. But really there's a whole lot more uh, attributes that goes into um, determining whether or not we're going to immediately accept or, or like or dislike another individual and that go into our determination of whether or not we're going to offer somebody a job interview or a, a position at our, our company. Go ahead. Now, I know our research team will say, wait, there's way more than two types of bias. However, for this discussion, there are two. We have explicit bias, 
which is attitudes or belief that you consciously hold about a person or a population. Whereas implicit bias, which we're going to be focusing on a little bit more today, are attitudes or beliefs that are not readily apparent to you. They're unconscious. And so for an example, I imagine that none of you would think that men six feet and over make the best CEOs. However, 58% of companies in North America are led by men who are six feet or over, whereas they only represent 14% of the population. That would be an implicit bias. Another example, a study that showed taking uh, resumes of uh, resumes and changing only the name on the resume and sending it to a bunch of different companies, names that appeared to be white and male were far more likely to be offered an interview. Nobody would outwardly say that they were they were choosing uh, interview applicants based strictly on a name, but clearly that is an implicit bias. I don't know if any of you have ever taken the Harvard implicit bias uh, test. Rob, or did that? Are you going to take us to that? Yeah, website? I was going to say um, it's a, it's what it does is it associates words. And you have to basically be able to choose them. But sometimes if there's you view some words as more negative and more positive, if you go onto the website, it's free to do. Uh, and you can actually take an implicit association test with uh, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and the, the important part is to really not think of people as 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 you know, you're you're good or you're not good. We all have biases. Um, it's how we choose to recognize that and act on it. That's really important. So it may surprise you that if I said I'm biased against Asian people, um, and that's a very common phenomenon of people who are of a, of a certain ethnicity who are actually biased against their own ethnicity. Uh, but you can imagine uh, perhaps my experience growing up uh, and uh, uh, being with a relative, attention being drawn to them when they speak, uh, how uncomfortable I would be with that, um, how I wish that that wouldn't happen. And it, it, it begins to form a, a bias within your, within your brain in terms of of, of association. Um, so this is not about um, bad or good. This is just a reality that we all have um, certain tendencies that we've evolved over the course of our lives. Uh, and this is just to bring awareness to it. Um, and so as Rod mentioned, uh, this is not bad or good, it just is. It's an adaptation for survival. Our brains are only able to interpret about 1% of what they see or hear. And so you very quickly have to distinguish what you, you believe is safe or likable or valuable. And sometimes our explicit and our implicit biases can contradict each other. So you think you think one thing, but really your brain is telling you something different. Um, and those biases may result in the stereotype that we talked about, which is, as we mentioned, the attribution of certain characteristics to a group of people. And we can all think of examples of what that might be. I'm sure they're running through your head right now. And these things can all be influenced, as Rod mentioned, by family, culture, role models that you've had, media, especially now that social media tends to only show you things that you have previously looked at. So it's going to almost set you up for a bias and a stereotype. And education as well you, uh, can contribute to biases. Now, there are a few things that we can do to try and mitigate our bias. So as far as your explicit, your conscious biases, what you have to do is just reflect on them. Why do I, why do I hold this bias? What can I do in my mind to change that? You can learn about your implicit biases. I have to tell you, I did this and I did one on gender and occupation. Now, I, it told me that I have a moderate um, bias towards men in science and women in arts. I would never have thought that to be true, but it came out on this test. And you think, you know, I'm just making a little mistake. It's kind of like a, a, a computer game where you have to tap quickly one way or the other. 
and the mistakes you make uh, reflect what you internally hold. So that was a surprise to me. So I encourage all of you to go to this website. They're free, they're, they don't take very long. Uh, they're kind of fun to do, but they'll show you a little bit about yourself. And then you can, you can change your practice. I'm not talking about your medical practice. I'm just talking about your, your practicing your brain and your life. These stereotypes that you hold, you have to counter think them. So for example, if you think that everyone who wears polka dots is a bad driver, you might want to start thinking about everyone who wears polka dots is not a bad driver. And then you're just kind of retraining your brain. And then the, another uh, thing you can practice is perspective taking. Just kind of think of, gee, I wonder why I think everybody with that wears polka dots is a bad driver. Is there a reason why you've come to that conclusion? And by increasing your the time that you spend with people who wear polka dots, you're more likely to lose your bias towards those polka dot wearing people. And um, as a, we mentioned earlier, inclusion is where we kind of all want to be. In uh, it was related to me by uh, some and expert, local experts in the field, that at EDI events, oftentimes it's even the leaders of these events that jump all over a, a attendee who might be new to the idea and ask the question using the wrong terminology, or they're the first ones to beat them down for, for using a term that's no longer accepted. And, you know, just like in COVID where things would change in the morning, noon and afternoon, uh, I think we're all finding ourselves where we're not quite sure what terms we're, we're supposed to be using these days. So the inclusion is important. When somebody says something that you think might be discriminatory or racist, maybe take a moment if you can to ask them where that came from. We learned about that a little bit with Kelly and Lindy a couple of weeks, or not Kelly, sorry, Bill and Lindy um, a couple of weeks ago where if you can take the time to, to, to stop and engage that person in a conversation about where that comment came from, you might find that it had absolutely nothing to do with trying to be discriminatory or racist, but more of a lack of understanding or a lack of awareness of how they're supposed to ask a question. So we all need to be the I in inclusion. And even the majority culture can be engaged in, in the whole EDI process by being allies and spokespeople and mentors and moving the ideas forward as well. And I just want to say how much this ties into a lot of the patient safety quality initiatives where we talk about biases, uh, anchoring, all this kind of stuff that, you know, we're trained to, to, to come up with our impressions incredibly quickly. You know, a 15 year old comes in with chest pain. Uh, uh, you know, a seven-year-old comes in with a headache where we immediately jump to what's likely or what not. And sometimes in medical errors, it's because we've, we've uh, made some assumptions that are very quick, uh, that, uh, that may be from our experience. Uh, and we've used that to, to come up with a diagnosis very quickly. And a lot of the techniques we learn in patient safety is to make sure that we recognize these biases and take a step back and use our cognitive brain and say, have I jumped too quickly to assume that this scenario is related to this? And, and have I been comprehensive enough uh, just to try to counter these biases. So a lot of the things that we're talking about in here, 100% apply to patient safety as well. This is just some uh, uh, um, information from a survey that we did uh, before COVID, uh, just looking at a little bit of, of uh, discrimination uh, witnessing, uh, just to, to, to show you that again, uh, probably that none of this will be too surprising to anybody. Um, I think this, as I said, this is a, uh, this is a, this is a, uh, uh, a journey that we're all going through together. This is not, not unique to us. So this question was, have you ever witnessed discrimination of a colleague from a patient during your practice of medicine? Um, and basically, uh, not surprising, uh, we have all witnessed, uh, 80 or 90% of us have witnessed some form of discrimination against our colleagues from uh, based on gender, ethnicity, sometimes age, to a lesser degree, religion, sexual orientation. Um, so quite prevalent uh, um, and probably not too surprising. Have we ever witnessed uh, discrimination of our staff or coworker to another staff uh, during your practice? And again, 
very similar uh, amounts of uh, in terms of the the types of in terms of gender and ethnicity a little bit less to age, um, but uh, but still quite prevalent. And the last one is: Have you personally dis experienced any discrimination from a staff or a coworker? And again, same kind of distribution, uh, thankfully to a lesser degree, um, but mostly based on gender, ethnicity, and age. Um, when asked if you've, if, if uh, this is two years ago, if uh, the, the survey taker themselves has discriminated against a patient based on those factors, uh, people uh, reflected and, and, and wondered whether ethnicity played uh, a role uh, in, in uh, some of the discrimination that, that they perceive. And again, very self-reflective question. Uh, and I wonder what those results would be now uh, after all of these movements in terms of how people would answer these questions now. Um, I'm just gonna show a video real quick and I, I just want to set up the set up the scenario. So a, a middle aged man uh, who is a visible minority uh, presents to the emergency department, uh, in this case in Toronto, and uh, presents with uh, excruciating leg pain, uh, had a relatively um, unremarkable past medical history, except that he is known to ha have bipolar disorder uh, and is on medication for it. Um, uh, objectively, uh, a, 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 the patient was obsessed, uh, obsessed <laughs> assessed and uh, did have an MRI, I believe, of the brain, uh, which was done, uh, which was negative. A consultation to psychiatry was performed who felt the patient was anxious and the patient was, uh, was, was told that, that it was likely not uh, organic uh, and they need to leave. And this is a video of them being uh, removed from the emergency department and this was in 2018. David Pontoni has been told to leave this Toronto hospital, but he can't walk. A nurse escorts him out. He remembers her words clearly. Get up, big boy. Get up. You can walk. You can walk. I know you can. I could not walk. I could not get up from that moment. Um, he was eventually uh, waited at home because he, he uh, took the advice that it was likely not organic. The pain continued to, to worsen. He was eventually uh, re-seen in an emergency department in Toronto and diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And that, so the question is, is if he was a six foot tall white CEO, would this have happened? Um, and again, just a, just a reflective question. This is uh, moving on forward in terms of the, of the poll. Um, uh, how much do people feel uh, that discrimination, non-equity, non-diversity is a problem in the following areas? Uh, with the blue, the light teal being a major problem and uh, yellow being a neutral, uh, which is neither a minor or a major problem, um, and green being not a problem at all. Uh, you can see that there's a, a wide uh, range of responses within our group, uh, with the one receiving the most um, uh, um, agreement in terms of as a major problem is barriers in the way that we select, uh, as well as a barriers to equity uh, uh, toward uh, patients from staff. Um, uh, and I'm just going to move this forward here. On a good front, uh, two years ago when asked, do you feel comfortable in your current work environment? The vast majority of people uh, definitely uh, affirmed that they were indeed uh, uh, felt comfortable in their current work environment. Uh, just a, another poll, um, just to, to see kind of the lay of the land, um, uh, just if you can answer the following question. And just remember to hit submit on the bottom because it is a very long, long question. Okay, great. And, and the, the, the little um, mountains you can see there are just the range of, 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 of answers. 
Um, so as you can kind of see, there's a lot of people that uh, that uh, don't are not aware of some of the EI initiatives that are going on, and uh, that's what we wanted to just try to uh, to to cover over the next few uh, few minutes. Um, you know, this is a journey, uh, and this is I, I always say, you know, um, when we see a, a 15 year old with uh, with a, a huge problems uh, behavior problems. Um, um, and you know uh, how long will it take for for them to 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 make a road to recovery? It took a long time to get here, and it'll take a long time to get out. Um, so I think the most important thing around any kind of EDI work is just to realize that you know let's let's always kind of walk into the right direction. Um, so it's so important for us to to just recognize that and move together. And and I, it's a really important chance for us to just highlight some of the important work that's being done. Um, I don't know if we just want to move forward, uh, Wanda, for, um, uh, to invite some of our guests to speak. Yes, I think that that would be a good idea. And then we'll have ample time at the end for us to um, share our thoughts. Great, great. Um, if we can turn the floor over to Adam, uh, we just asked Adam at a very high level just to highlight some of the EDI initiatives that, may, that are occurring within our hospital. Thanks, everyone. It's uh, great, to, great to be here. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Just look for a thumbs up that we can actually see that. Good. Thank you very much. Um, so thanks very much, Wanda and Rod, uh, for, oh, we got right to the end there really quickly. Thanks very much, Wanda and Rod, for, for having me. I'm going to try and do a very high level uh, highlights of some of the activity at equity uh, in equity or diversity and inclusion at LHSC currently. Um, and uh, I'll start with the um, caveat that this is not, although I'm somewhat involved, I'm certainly not leading this work. Uh, and, and that's not to, meant not to um, decrease the importance of it, but just that I'm providing highlights of work that is being led by others. Um, so it's a bit of a framework that's out there for how hospitals uh, should approach uh, should approach EDI, um, and it involves really two main streams, and that is focusing on the people that uh, work on your teams, uh, and also focusing on the patients. And it is a bit of a different lens. They need to come together and have have similar concepts, um, but there are it is two different types of work, and that's how it's been approached so far at LHSC. There's also uh, six different uh, bullets on the left-hand side of the screen that you'll you'll see that are some of the key elements of a successful EDI program, at least uh, that has been successful in other institutions, mostly south of the border, but also in uh, in Canada. So where are we at on the journey uh, for EDI at LHC? I mentioned on the last slide that we separate out our people or our staff and docs, uh, our staff and other providers uh, from our patients and our community. And in terms of our EDI strategies for our people, um, when talking to my colleagues, uh, many of us would uh, put us at the uh, gestation stage. Uh, so just getting started essentially. Uh, with our patients in our community, it's a little bit further along and I'll give you some examples of why that is. But in both areas, tons of room for improvement uh, and lots, lots of work to do still. So what about our people? Um, so I'll try and describe again at a very high level, uh, the initial steps that are being taken some of the data collection, preliminary findings that have happened and next steps uh, for, for our teams. In terms of initial steps, um, you might recall back around uh, this time last year, uh, there was a declarative statement made by our, our then CEO, Paul Woods, uh, right around the George Floyd incident around how, um, you know, basically unacceptable it was. And then similarly around the indigenous uh, patient situation that happened in Quebec, um, at the same time as that declarative statement, there was discussions at our ELC table around appointing a chief diversity officer. That seems like the right thing to do, but prior to, prior to getting to that stage, um, our executive leadership committee uh, hired a, a consultant to come in uh, and do both an internal and external review of where we're at for, for provider or pe our people facing uh, EDI strategies, and also to do a summary of the research in, uh, in hospitals. So it'd be the, the initial steps and, and then data collection phase. So what about preliminary findings? So um, the consultants group has talked to a number of individuals, uh, both uh, within and outside our organization. And what we've heard is that there's uh, EDI programs within specific uh, programs or departments, which is not unusual for an institution the size of London Health Sciences Center. 
but there isn't anything that's cross corporate across the entire organization that coordinates and oversees an overall corporate uh, corporate hospital EDI strategy. Um, most people that are consulted are highly supportive of moving in this direction, thankfully. And the major concerns that are being raised are, uh, will the support that's needed be, uh, at, be given to this type of an initiative uh, in an environment where we're, we have trouble buying the capital that we need to run our institution and provide good patient care? So how do you prioritize um, and how do you make it a priority amongst uh, priorities? Um, when we ask senior leaders where they see LHSC on an EDI scale, interestingly, similar to the scale that Rod and Wanda just set up, sort of a two to three out of 10 in terms of how far, uh, how far we need to go. Um, many commented that it's just something we need, we need to do. So what about next steps? Um, so um, the consultation phase is actually just, in, in just being completed. Um, we will need to establish a strategy and a structure. So um, like everything in, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of um, life and, and business, uh, you need to have the right people and you need to have, know where you're headed with this. Um, that term chief diversity officer will likely be, uh, be, become, a, become true and we'll have to recruit and select a person into that role. Um, and then that will help ingrain EDI into the institution as something that we eventually uh, just do. Obviously this needs to be supported and practiced by our board, our senior leadership, our providers and be done in concert with our key stakeholders like Western. And I know we'll hear from some of our Shulik colleagues, uh, I believe after this. So this is probably a little more familiar to many of you, especially given the location that this this mural was placed uh, just outside the E-Wing uh, Emerge uh, offices in that little central area that in the parking lot we used to be able to park, on, park in before the generators had to be replaced. Um, and so this is uh, a little bit further along the road, like I mentioned, um, but it's still relatively new. All of this work has happened in the past 18 to 24 months. So in a, in a health equity, and really during COVID, a health equity office was stood up uh, in early 2020 with described goals and accountabilities. And this is again, patient facing. Uh, and so far there's been a, the majority of focus has been on indigenous health in keeping with the federal and provincial direction. Um, and also even our local uh, chiefs council recently has highlighted that um, if we truly want to go through truth and reconciliation and truly want to engage in our indigenous both healthcare providers and healthcare recipients, that it needs to be its own separate stream. So you'll see how that's been highlighted to date uh, and is highlighted in, in the walls of our organization now. I will not review all the all, all of the information on this slide, um, but just to highlight a few things that have happened uh, in the past uh, in the past eighteen months. So, for example, uh, the gender identity and sex data collection is being updated in Cerner as of July, um, and so you know really ongoing work despite COVID uh, to to advance to advance this. Uh, the health equity standards self assessment. So this will be rolled out across the institution. And many of you, for those of you that completed the Our People survey, will note that there were some specific questions added this year to that survey to get a general state of, the, state of affairs um, for health equity and diversity. Specific Indigenous health initiatives. So I mentioned uh, the Indigenous Healing Centre, uh, which is behind the mural uh, that, that's been uh, put up in um, in the E Tower, uh, and there actually has been care provided in that area. So, inpatients, as well as I understand, a few eMERGE patients uh, of Indigenous heritage have been taken over to that healing space. And while receiving their North American uh, medicine, have also received traditional uh, Indigenous medicine at the, at the same time within the walls of LHSC. So, although we have a long way to go, some work has happened. Another element I wanted to highlight was. The, at the bottom of this slide, education. Um, so LHSC has in, invested uh, money and time in having all senior medical and administrative leaders uh, have complete training in Indigenous uh, cultural sensitivity. Uh, and I believe it's at about 85 to 90% of taking that training during COVID. Uh, and we're looking at, at the next stage of that. Just some resources for those of you interested from the patient lens. So patients uh, that have, uh, you have health equity concerns about or opportunities for, there's some resources included in the slides that I can share after. Uh, sorry, oh dear, how do we do that? Just lastly, acknowledgements uh, for Rob Sibold, who's our ethicist, who's the lead of our health equity office and patient experience, as well as Bill Wilkinson, uh, who is the head consultant on our people facing strategy. 
as always, uh, hopefully most of you know me, I'm always open to feedback, comments, criticism, concerns, and we're, keep that open door policy at, at all times. So don't hesitate to email me. Hey, thanks so much. Sharing. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, just I, I, I know at the time. Um, so we're just going to uh, quickly go uh, from a Shulik point of view. Um, I know I see Andrew here, not to put you on the spot, Andrea, but just some high level um, thoughts around uh, Shulik's um, uh, EDI initiatives. Thank you, Rob. Um, I kind of just jumped on your meeting this morning and thank you for inviting us. Just to give you a bit of a snapshot as well, you might recall that Chulik had an assistant dean of equity and uh, faculty equity and wellness, and that was Dr. Mitu Sen. When her role finished, um, Chulik actually, it was primed for a refresh. So at the current time, Dean Yu is um, in the process of having an associate dean, so that's the next level up, of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, there is a bit of work still to be done. The question of do we include Indigenous um, work in this role? Because um, as you may know, our local Indigenous lead in residence has uh, moved on to a different role. So there's a lot of discussion. What I do see is that we are going to be moving forward on this um, soon. So for those of you, and I'm, I'm thrilled with the engagement of your department, for those of you who have an interest in this area, please stay tuned because there are opportunities. I'm delighted to hear about the Chief Diversity Officer from Adam. I must say I, I wasn't fully aware and I can see that this is um, a great opportunity for collaboration with uh, London Health Sciences. In terms of the next steps, there is now also um, beyond EDI and Indigenous, the question of social accountability. So again, how do we together move forward in, in many of the work that needs to be done? And your survey, uh, Rod, um, is very telling. We have a long ways to go but we are um, in the process of developing some of these initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Again, we put you on the spot, but uh, great uh, kind of overview of what's going on at Shulik and we're excited to see what's going to continue to happen. Uh, next, we're going to ask Munsif if he can fill us in a little bit about what's been going on in both residency programs. Uh, uh, Rod Sedrin is off canoeing in some remote island somewhere, so uh, Munsif is actually going to speak for both programs and the work that we've been doing and fairness in CARMS. Munsif? Hey guys, thanks. Uh, thanks for including me on this. I just have that slide to share. Um, so this has been a work in progress uh, for uh, the EM program. Uh, which took the lead on this uh, initiative. Uh, and over the last three to four years, uh, we've done a significant work in reducing bias in CARMS. Um, just to quickly summarize, in 2018, Kelly Regan asked the first question uh, at the end of a CARMS iteration as to whether there was bias in the CARMS process. Um, that led to a lot of reflection and analysis. And uh, our answer was yes, there were elective biases, knowledge biases, system biases, and staff biases. That led to our first working group uh, back then um, which uh, uh, came up with a meritorious based selection process that we've tried to implement gradually over the last three to four years. As you can imagine, the work required was immense um, and eliminating biases accumulated over many years is no small task. Our working group one came up with nine qualities uh, to um, include in a meritorious selection process. And then we tried to implement these qualities in our selection process over a three year period, initially starting with the uh, 2019 bias-free interview, uh, which was designed by our first working group. And again, I wouldn't take any names because there's way too many people to acknowledge for the work done. Um, and we created a, a, a known standard interview with case-based questions, MMIs, and scenarios, totally eliminating any biased questions or um, uh, processes that were uh, part of the CARM selection in the interview side of things. In 2020, we additionally started to change the file review process in addition to the interview. Um, and then uh, in 
included an anonymous file review process as part of the file review for CARMS. And so 50% uh, of the mark for the file review process was actually based on a completely anonymized CARMS package, which was provided to the file reviewers. Um, that was work done by our second working group. We're now on to our third working group. And uh, what we have now done is added uh, in addition to uh, an anonymous file review, a completely anonymous application as part of the CARMS with standardized questions. And we've now added external reviewers for letters of references. So our letters of references will be totally unbiased uh, in their review because we've approached external reviewers. Um, and each of these processes that we've added every year is on top of what has been done earlier. So the earlier processes remain and continue to get improved while additional unbiased uh, processes are added with the final goal of having a completely unbiased process over a five-year period. Uh, so that's our five-year plan in the EM program. And I'm happy to announce that the FR program has joined us in this initiative. Uh, both uh, Mike Clementi and Rob Sedrin attended our last meeting and will be extending some of these processes into the FR program. One of our residents, Ada, is uh, uh, currently completing her residency. I don't think she's on the call today because she's um, either um, work uh, or post call or on call, I'm not sure, um, but has actually started to do some research around this. And hopefully we can uh, make this uh, um, uh, work um, uh, attractive uh, as research projects for future residents. Uh, so that's where we stand. And uh, again, I thank everybody who's participated with me on this journey. Uh, Kelly Regan for asking the first question uh, back in 2018 and uh, everyone's work in this area. Thanks. Thank you, Mansif. Um, I, I know I've been involved with that as well and it's really made a, a huge difference in, in how we think about our, our selection process for all of the residents. Now we're going to move on at some of the local involvement at the Cape level. Is, is Dawn Giffen here? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there you are. All right, thank you. Thank you, Wanda and Rod, for facilitating the rounds and for the chance to advertise an upcoming pre-conference symposium at this year's Cape Conference. So this session will be happening on the afternoon of June 14th. Um, the topic of the panel is how should CAPE best engage in sustained action to address racism and colonialism in emergency medicine and is taking uh, place under the auspices of the CAPE Leadership Committee, Rod Lim and Judy Morris. So this is the project lead, Dr. Jennifer Bryan, who is an emergency physician at UHN and the Director of Operations of the Toronto Addis Ababa Academic Collaboration in Emergency Medicine at U of T and also a founding member of the UHN ER Sickle Cell Working Group. So the goals of the panel are threefold, to discuss how EDs can promote culturally safe practices in caring for patients, um, how can we educate and support ED trainees longitudinally to address clinical and academic, um, to address racism and colonialism in their practices, and how we can create clinical and academic environments conducive to the success of BIPOC emergency physicians. So this panel is taking place after a year of extensive interviews with patient advocates, community groups, community, community activists, academic advisors, including uh, Western's Dr. Loy Wiley and her team, a community symposium, collaboration with nursing and allied health and security colleagues, as well as an extensive literature search. So there are regular meetings with a working group of approximately 30 emergency physicians from across the Canada with very varied ex practice settings and backgrounds. So the other panel members besides myself are James Liu on the left. Um, we have been working on the patient care panel. Uh, the middle two panel members are Sarah Alavian, a uh, eMERGE resident at McMaster and Connie LeBlanc who is uh, Emerge at um, QE2 and Associate Dean of Con Continuing Professional Development at Dalhousie. And on the right are um, Dominic Shelton 
and Prashant Felber, who are the leads for physician advancement. And uh, Dominic is a founding member of the Black Physicians Ontario uh, Association of Ontario and creator of the very successful summer mentorship program for Black and Indigenous students at U of T. And Prashant is an emergency doctor at William Osler Health System in Brampton. So there will be a presentation of about 25 minutes uh, within the hour panel and lots of time for chat and discussion following that and opportunity for CAPE members to volunteer to participate in further work in this area. So all are encouraged to attend and participate. Looking forward to seeing you on June 14th. Thanks so much, Don. And, and I, I just wanna highlight the um, tremendous amount of work uh, that you've put in over the course of the year. Um, there's been so much engagement across the country with so many different stakeholders. And uh, again, Don is one of the principal panelists uh, on that uh, committee. Um, that that half that the afternoon session that we're talking about on June 14th is that's one of three panels. Um, our goal is to create recommendations for Canadian academic EM units uh, in terms of tangible ways to move equity, diversity, inclusion forward. I'm just going to highlight the second panel real quick before talking about the uh, third panel that uh, we have uh, other uh, Western involvement. Um, the second panel is on uh, how can uh, how should CAPE best support improvements in gender equity for women and non-binary physicians working in emergency medicine? Uh, again, um, uh, led by our leadership committee uh, with the project lead uh, of Emma, uh, Dr. Emma McKelvin Brown uh, from uh, Memorial. Uh, have done an amazing job uh, and their goals are as listed. How can we identify and address gender biases that affects women and non-binary physicians day-to-day -day experiences working in emergency medicine? How can we identify and reduce the impact of gender bias on medical trainees and improve access to emergency medicine mentorship for women and binary non-binary trainees? And lastly, what systems and policies in emergency medicine discriminated based on gender and what work needs to be done to improve these? Again, have engaged, uh, has have met regularly over the past year and have done tremendous work across the country. And so excited for that uh, for that panel discussion. Uh, the third panel, uh, sorry, and this is again the same format. They have one hour as well to, to begin the work, but it's just the beginning. Um, and the third panel, um, uh, Wanda, do you want to talk about uh, if Kelly gave you any uh, things or do you want to just show the video? Uh, she talks on the video. Let's just check to see if she was able to join. Kelly, are you online here? She's working at a hospitalist job today and was trying to see if she could pop in, but it doesn't look like she has. So she did provide us this very short uh, video to share with you. And this is the third panel looking at uh, 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 LGBTQ uh, 2S plus um, issues and mostly around curriculum development. Um, but so I'll go ahead and play this video. Hi everyone. I was asked by Dr. Millar to speak briefly about my project and how it relates to the upcoming CAPE Symposium. My project is entitled Beatitudes, Behaviors and Comfort of Canadian Emergency Medicine Residents and Physicians in Caring for 2S LGBTQI plus patients. So this is just a very brief background about the care of these patients in the emergency department. Um, as you can see, these patients are frequently discriminated against and have very poor negative experiences in the emergency department. My study was conducted as a survey across Canada using the Cape Mailer and various social media channels, and it was based off of a previous similar study conducted in the United States. These are just some highlights from our study, and we found that uh, a majority of people found that it was more challenging to conduct an exam on transgender and intersex patients compared to other patients. In terms of other highlights from our study, we found that 54% of respondents somewhat or strongly agreed that they had observed other healthcare workers making discriminatory or inappropriate comments about these patients and staff. In regards to the resident respondents, we also found that a majority of them actually desired more hours of teaching towards these patients during the residency training programs. Within the subgroup of residents who had responded that they had heard discriminatory comments towards these patients, we found that the majority of these were from either senior faculty or nursing staff. Overall, we found that Canadian physicians believe these patients deserve equitable care. We did find that history taking and physical examination were difficult for certain populations. And we also found that residents desire more teaching and that discrimination is unfortunately still an issue, even in 2021. And I guess that's a nice segue into my next slide here. Um, so CAPE is doing an academic symposium this year on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And uh, myself and Dr. Ng will be representing uh, on this specific panel, which takes place on the 14th um, at this time that I have here on the slide. 
uh, we'll basically be going over various recommendations that we have for the participants and breaking into small groups and just having a good discussion on how we can improve the care of these patients in the emergency department. And um, I hope that you have the time to join us and contribute. Thanks. So I just want to thank, again, uh, uh, because of that expertise uh, and, and her work in that area, they were invited to be part of the panel and have been instrumental uh, uh, in that development. So uh, very excited about that third panel as well. And sorry for going six minutes over, but just for the last three minutes, turn over to Wanda uh, as we conclude that uh, this portion of our talk. Yes, yes, I think what we'll do is, again, thank everybody who's brought uh, the work that's being done on EDI uh, around our community and nationally in our organization to the forefront so that we know that, that things are happening, even if we, where you sit and stand, it doesn't seem obvious. Uh, I, we were planning on having an opportunity for some discussion, but I think what we'll do is I've got one last presentation, which we'll do first so that everybody who has to leave can jump off the call. And then if anybody wants to stay on, we'll, we'll continue with a little bit of a, a thoughts session where you can share anything that you would like to share and, and we'll stay on for that. So one of the things that um, we do annually, most of you would know if you, you may not, is have an, a Department of Emergency Medicine annual awards day. Last year, it was during the initial stages of the pandemic and just was not the appropriate thing to do. And this year, we really thought that we, instead of highlighting a few deserving people, we wanted to recognize that everybody has worked extremely hard under difficult conditions, maintain your compassion for your patients and your colleagues. And we wanted to do a little something to recognize uh, that work that has been done by all team members in the emergency department. So Christy and Rod and I put our heads together and we decided that it might be a little bit fun if everybody would got a nice beach bag to use for this summer. It says, sunshine is the best medicine. So these are available for everyone in the ED team. Uh, an email will be going out today showing you where you can pick yours up. But for the physicians, they're in the uh, change room at UH and in the chart room at Vic, and you can just uh, sign off on the sheet that's there and take your bag and hopefully fill it with a lot of fun things as you head outside into the sunshine this summer. So on behalf of Rod and Christy and I, thank you very much for everything you do. We're nearing the end of this ultra marathon of a pandemic, but We've negotiated it successfully and judging by the smiles I see on people's face, I think we've still got a little bit left in us. So thank you for joining us today. If you have to leave, by all means, go ahead. But if anybody would like to share their thoughts, I mean, we'd, we'd like to hear what you have to say and encourage you to, to talk about what we spoke on today. Oh, it looks like everybody wants to get out in the sun, <laughs> which I don't blame them. So if, if, if nobody has anything that they want to add uh, in response, I'm sure that this will initiate a conversation uh, amongst yourselves in the department, um, uh, in your life, in your, with your friends, and then we can continue to move EDI initiatives forward. And I would ju just like to encourage anybody who hasn't already signed up for CAPE to do so. I, I think it's really going to be a great program, a great virtual program this year, including all the uh, EDI initiatives of which Rod is the chair. Rod, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, there was a question that you don't have to be a member to, uh, to join the, um, uh, well, you don't have to be a member to, join, to, to attend the conference, but uh, the actual symposium itself is $25. Uh, so it's very cheap. Um, it's going to be jam-packed, uh, incredible speakers. We have some guest speakers as well. Um, and we're just super excited about the community that we've built uh, in terms of working together and, and trying to move our profession uh, in, in, a, in a positive direction. 
Uh, so thank you everyone and, and uh, enjoy, the, uh, enjoy the beautiful weather out there. Bye.